will eat the bugs. Eating insects could help fight world hunger. From caterpillars and cockroaches to mealworm-covered apples. You will live in the pot. We tend what we call pedestrians into the space. There's no privacy. As you see, there's no curtain. There's no wall. You will wear the mask. When I do not have to wear the mask on. You will get the bar seen. You will welcome the refugee. You will celebrate Pride Year. Children. You will watch the Hollywood movies. <laughs> you will celebrate diversity. <laughs> you will watch the pornography. You want some big fucking cock? Yeah. If you get changed. Yeah. And so, so, so this is where you live. What do you like about it? You will consume the product. <gasps> Don't ask questions. Get excited for next product. You will not spread anti-Semitism. This was posted by a professor at Rutgers University on his Facebook page. There is absolutely no price to pay who openly expresses such violence. You will fight white people. You will put your kid on puberty blockers. Well, you're a boy, right? No, I'm a girl. My son started telling me that he had a girl's brain in a boy's body. All of his authority figures telling me he's a girl. You will send your daughter to a movie. <laughs> you will have no privacy. You will own nothing. Now is the historical moment the time to shape the system. And you will be happy. As a young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, half of this government are actually young noble leaders of the world. Incredible. So if we penetrate the cabinets. The change is not just happening. The change can be shaped by us. We have to prepare for a more angry world. How to prepare to take the necessary action to create a fairer world? I see the need for a great reset. So people assume we are just going back to the good old world which we had and everything will be normal again. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. It will not happen. There is only one way this pandemic is going to go. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Pay insufficient attention to the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19 crisis would be seen in this respect as a small disturbance in comparison to a major cyber attack. But uh, look, today my administration has issued new warnings that based on evolving intelligence, Russia may be planning a cyber attack against us. And as I said, the magnitude of Russia's cyber capacity is fairly consequential, and it's coming. The federal government is doing its part to get ready. But under U.S. law, as you all remember, the private sector, all of you, 
largely decides the protections that is, we will or will not take. Urging private sector partners to take immediate action to shore up their defenses against potential cyber attacks. We've previously warned about the potential for Russia to conduct cyber attacks against the United States, including as a, re as a response to the unprecedented economic costs that the U.S. and allies and partners impose in response to Russia's further invasion of Ukraine. Today, we are reiterating those warnings, and we're doing so based on evolving threat intelligence that the Russian government is exploring options for potential cyber attacks on critical infrastructure in the United States. Mr. Kurtz, welcome back to Mad Money. Thanks for being here, Jim, and uh, I wish it was under better circumstances. Obviously, there's a great human toll taking place, but uh, I'm happy to talk to you about cybersecurity. Thank you so much, George. Now, you heard the president's warning. First, are we prepared? And second, I'm not used to hearing us playing offense. Are we? Well, you have to look at both countries. Uh, the United States and Russia have great cyber capabilities. And in any modern war, cyber is a critical element, air, sea, land, and cyber. And uh, we have to be ready. Un un unfortunately, you know, 85 percent of the infrastructure is, is owned by private companies. And uh, when we think about that critical infrastructure, it isn't always up to uh, the level we would like from a cybersecurity perspective. We've seen that with some of the pipelines. So we have to be vigilant and we have to be ready for these attacks. George, there was a concentrated selling in the bank stocks. And from what I can tell, it was not the fact that interest rates went down, which is bad for their earnings, but it was because people feel they're the most logically targeted after we've targeted five Russian banks. Are the banks ready? I'm not going to single out any particular one, but do you think the banks are spending enough? The banks, from a sector perspective, have done a great job. There's a lot of regulation around what they do. Thankfully, they have the money to actually put in a, a mature security technology like CrowdStrike. We protect 14 of the top 20 banks out there. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not just one company. It's not CrowdStrike. It's a holistic view of people, process, and technology. And I can tell you, I've talked to a lot of banks recently, a lot of senior executives. Uh, and they're concerned. They're very concerned about what might happen here. And, and they should be, because when you think about uh, some of the collateral damage that might take place from these, we call them wiper uh, viruses, which are designed to basically wipe a system. Um, when we think about cyber, there, it has no boundaries for collateral damage. You know, a, a missile has a fixed area of, of uh, destruction in cyber. We saw, we saw it in 2017 with NotPetya, it basically ran loose and caused $10 billion worth of damage. Well, it, can you tell us what happened in the previous Russian cyber attacks in, on Ukraine? Because apparently they were very proficient and very good at what they did. Well, when you look at Russia, they certainly have uh, phenomenal cyber capabilities and various uh, groups within their government. And in 2017, this was what I was referring to, a, an attack called NotPetya, took place in the Ukraine, and it was designed to, to focus on the Ukraine. Uh, but unfortunately, it's almost like biological warfare. When, when this sort of malware gets released, you don't realize how many connections there actually are. And we saw a lot of companies in the U.S. that were actually connected to this, this payroll or tax software that was being used in the Ukraine, and it spread through the ne network very quickly. And that's what I was saying. There is no boundary in cyber. And the unintended consequences that many organizations, government, critical infrastructure, and others can be taken out from a, a specific attack by Russia against Ukraine. That's now, one piece. The second piece, sorry, the second piece is then obviously we're worried about attacks against the U.S. SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, is going through a midlife crisis. The network operator is the backbone of payment services for more than 11,000 institutions across more than 200 countries and territories, including banks and corporations. If a bank is wiring money to someone, chances are SWIFT is involved somewhere along the way. The transaction messaging behemoth touts a failure is not an option level of security. That includes its data centers in three low-profile locations in Switzerland, the Netherlands, Virginia, and a fourth operation site known only to a handful of SWIFT executives. But a series of recent cyber attacks targeting banks raises questions about the security of the SWIFT network and the global banking system's heavy reliance on it. SWIFT says its core messaging platform is uncompromised. 
Swift began in Belgium in 1973 as a cooperative of 239 banks, aiming to replace Telex. By the time the system went live in 1977, its 518 member banks from 22 countries were sending 51,700 messages a day. Daily message volumes on Swift exceeded 25 million in July 2016, and the network now handles more than 6 billion messages a year. The company continues to grow rapidly, adding a range of ancillary products and services. It also has been adding operations in emerging markets, which sometimes have less sophisticated security practices and have been the source of recent customer breaches. In 2015, hackers stole $9 million from a bank customer of Swift in Ecuador and attempted another attack on a bank in Vietnam. In February 2016, hackers walked away with $81 million from Bangladesh's central bank, which had an account with the New York Fed. The hackers have not been identified. SWIFT's authentication process is designed to check that a message's sender and receiver are who they say they are. But if hackers gain control of a user's credentials, SWIFT may not detect the intrusion until it's too late. SWIFT also considers user and security to be the responsibility of its customers. It doesn't always audit customer sites to ensure compliance with network guidelines. SWIFT revealed in September three new cyber breaches without disclosing their scale or locations or the banks affected. More breaches may have occurred since then. The recent breaches at customer sites are forcing SWIFT to make crucial changes in the way it operates. It has hired cyber forensic teams, distributed software patches, and is publishing anonymized incident reports on a restricted part of its network so that users can track attack developments. SWIFT's lead regulator is the National Bank of Belgium, which is asking the company to continuously report developments. Overall, SWIFT is overseen by the world's largest central banks, including the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is actively monitoring SWIFT's response to cyber attacks. A significant global outage would slow payments to a crawl. SWIFT isn't the only messaging service for large payments, but it is easily the most popular one, and switching to alternatives would be possible, but difficult. Swift's progress reports will be closely watched, given its mission-critical role in banking. I can't believe the state to which the country has degenerated. I've been in contact with a reliable source within the Canadian military, and he told me today by email that if I had any sense, I'd take my money out of the Canadian banks because the situation is far worse than I've been informed. And so that's just one of many such messages I receive on a daily basis. So let's talk about the bank. So here's what our prime minister did last week. He permanently destroyed 20% of the population's faith in the entire Canadian banking system and stained the Canadian banking system's international reputation, I would say, for decades. I go in the bank, ask for 100 k they give me 30000 Talking about that's all they got. I ask for 100000 How y'all only got 30000 in the bank? Where my money at? Make it make sense. A local couple just had $24,000 ripped from their account, and tonight they're making sure that you don't fall victim too. Like a lot of others, they used a popular new way to invest their money, but hackers went after them. Fox 35's Lara Greenberg spoke with the couple and has more on how you can protect your money. It was the $0 balance in his account that first alerted Vincent Berggren something was off. I just thought it was a glitch or something. No glitch. This was his reality. Bergren and his girlfriend, Zoe Westervelt, say they had $24,000 stolen from them, hacked out of their Coinbase account. We're very good people and like we work hard for our money. We've both been working since we were able to be in the workforce and it just sucks that our money can just be taken away from us like that. Coinbase is a cryptocurrency app that stores digital money. The couple had a password and two-step authentication, but apparently it wasn't enough to protect them from hackers. Now Altamont Springs Police and Coinbase have told them there is not much they can do. Coinbase sent Fox 35 a statement saying they take extensive security measures to ensure customer accounts remain as safe as possible. But ultimately, they do not cover any losses resulting from unauthorized access to Coinbase accounts due to a compromise of a customer's login credentials. You're storing it with those organizations 
in the hopes that they're going to protect it as well. And unfortunately, uh, we've been seeing that ha that hasn't been the case. Cybersecurity expert James McQuiggan recommends using an authenticator app for extra protection or buying a security key that requires your fingerprint to access accounts. And this is kind of what it looks like. It's like a little USB device that you can plug into your computer. He also recommends changing your password frequently. Vincent says he'd been receiving texts for a few days before the hack and ignored them. Now he realizes he shouldn't have. I was just like, oh, it must be a glitch. Like, this is just weird. Why is this enemy codes? The couple says at this point, they've accepted they've lost the 24 grand. In Altamont Springs, Lyra Greenberg, Fox 35 News. Holy smokes, everyone. You're not going to believe the simulation that our global elites just ran. In this video, I'm gonna go over a new risk, something that I haven't really been talking about and something I haven't really seen many people talk about at all and probably the last thing you think would be a huge risk for the markets. But if this simulation that they run does come into fruition in 2022, kind of like a simulation that they did in 2019 and then something kind of bad happened in 2020, which you can't really get into, this could completely shut down the financial system as we know it. So everyone, what is this simulation? Who was involved and what exactly happened? Let's have a look. Look at this everyone. 10 countries simulate a cyber attack on the global financial system. Now I don't know about you, but me, I've been seeing this more and more in the media. People warning about cyber security. And what have we seen in 2021? We've seen many cyber attacks. Go back to Squawk, the largest U.S. fuel pipeline is now the victim of a ransomware attack. Hundreds of supermarkets in Sweden are forced to close after a cyber attack that's hit organizations all around the world. New ransomware attack, this time on the U.S. beef supply. It appears to be part of a strategy to target our daily life. First, the Colonial Pipeline attack raises gas prices for millions of Americans. Now this attack raises food prices across the country. But imagine what would happen if the whole financial system suffered a huge cyber attack. So on December 9th, they led a 10 country simulation of a major cyber attack on the global financial system in an attempt to increase cooperation that could help minimize any potential damage to the financial markets and of course, the banks. It's all about saving the banks here, everybody, not you and me. Now, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I'm seeing more and more of our leaders kind of hint that this could be something coming. We saw Jerome Powell when he had his uh, 60 Minutes interview uh, early this year, and I did a video on it. He says, the biggest risk of all is a cyber attack on the financial system. Um, I, I would say, you know, cyber risk, the risk of a successful cyber attack is, for me, uh, you know, always the most, uh, you know, one that we uh, we would be very difficult to deal with. I think we know uh, how to deal with bad loans and things like that. I think more a cyber attack that were to take down a major financial institution or financial market utility would be a, a really significant financial stability risk that we haven't actually faced yet. So um, I could go on with a list of horribles, but. I think that's a that's a that's a decent picture of where I would start. We also seen our favorite man, Wob, aka Dr. Evil. He's warned of huge cyber attacks that will be coming. And some would say this is just them getting people used to the idea of when it comes and then they'll have the problem reaction solution. They'll say, Look, we've been warning about this cyber attack's gonna come. There'll be a huge crazy reaction. It seems like the world's got to end. And of course, then they'll come up with a solution that normally benefits them and benefits global elites. The simulated war game, as Israel's finance ministry called it, and planned over the past year, evolved over 10 days with sensitive data emerging on the dark web. The simulation also used fake news reports that in the scenario caused chaos in global markets and run on the banks. Now, this is something you may think that's unbelievable. But imagine if someone was able to do a cyber attack or an attack on the mainstream media or the mainstream financial news and put out an article, for example, to say that, you know, America, Bank of America, they've gone down, they've got no money, or they say this financial institution's gone down, they put out a fake news article, and this causes panic, people run to the banks. Now, of course, remember, your money's not safe in the bank. When you put your money in the bank, you are making a loan to the bank, you're an unsecured creditor, and really they may only have 5% per 
maybe not even that 1% of cash reserves compared to the digital money that you have in your bank account. The simulation likely caused by what officials called sophisticated players featured several types of attacks that impacted global foreign exchange and bond markets, liquidity, integrity of data, and transactions between importers and exporters. Well, everyone, this simulation is getting worse and worse and scarier and scarier. And we may think that this would never happen, but look what happened in 2020. I'm sure in 2019, none of us thought that would happen, but it did. So it says here they could attack the global foreign exchange markets. And imagine if all of a sudden global currencies and exchange rates went haywire. They could freeze up liquidity in markets like the bond market and also data on the stock market for transactions could be lost or manipulated. And listen to this. These events are creating havoc in the financial markets, said a narrator of the film show to the participants as part of the simulation and seen by Reuters. Israeli government officials said that such threats are possible in the wake of the many high profile cyber attacks on large companies and that the only way to contain any damage is through global cooperation since current cyber security is not always strong enough. Now listen to this statement everybody, this is huge. Attackers are 10 steps ahead of the defender, said financial cyber manager at Israel's finance ministry. So they're pretty much just saying it straight that our current cyber security is not good enough for the current technology that the attackers have. Because remember, there's a lot more money in these cyber attacks than paying for defense. Companies are all about profit. They're probably the last thing they're thinking about is spending millions or billions of dollars on cyber security. And so these criminals, they are finding leaks in the system. And it's only a matter of time before they find a leak in the financial system. And these are the countries that were involved in this simulation. Participants in the initiative called Collective Strength included Treasury officials from Israel, the United States, the United Kingdom, United Arab Emirates, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Thailand, as well as representatives from the International Monetary Fund and World Bank and Bank of International Settlements. Hey everyone, this is some very, very powerful people at the table. The World Bank, the IMF, the Bank of International Settlements, these are the bankers for the banks. These are the shadow banks. These are the people that really run the financial system and run the world. These unelected officials that you may not know much about. The narrator of the film in the simulation said governments were under pressure to clarify the impact of the attack, which was paralyzing the global markets. The banks are appealing for emergency liquidity assistance in multitude of currencies to put a halt to the chaos as counterparties withdraw their funds and limit access to liquidity, leaving the banks in disarray and ruin. Again, people, this may seem like the extreme and impossible, but bank runs in the early 1900s were very common and it caused absolute chaos. Now again, can you just imagine what would happen in this situation? They put out an article, your bank's got no more money. People are running there. This is going to cause chaos. People all of a sudden may not be able to withdraw their money from their cryptocurrency exchanges, maybe from their stockbrokers. Credit cards will go down. Lines of credit will go down. You won't be able to buy groceries from the grocery store or put fuel in your car. But really the worst case scenario is if they could do a sophisticated attack on the financial system and send the value of assets to zero. Now imagine if that happened everyone. You may think it's impossible with everything digitalized these days. What you think is impossible is in fact possible and this is what they're warning about. The participants discuss multilateral policies to respond to the crisis, including a coordinated bank holiday, debt repayment grace periods, swap slash repo agreements, and coordinated delinking from major currencies. So again, everyone, problem, reaction, solution. The solution that they could give is banking holidays. Maybe you won't be able to access your money in your bank account. Like we saw in 2020, when all of a sudden nobody had to pay their loans, you know, it was just free money for all. People didn't have to pay their mortgage. We could see more and more of this, and then just really central banks monetizing the debt through the repo markets and swap markets by adding more and more liquidity into the system to give to the banks while they aren't getting money from people repaying their loans. And they also said there'll be coordinated delinking of major currencies. So there could be a huge, huge change in the global financial markets with major currencies, 
we could see a new world reserve currency. So everyone, what does this mean for you and me in simple terms and how can we prepare for this Armageddon-like scenario? Well, like you've probably all been warned and like I've warned about in the past is your money is not safe in the banks. If you got huge and huge amounts of cash in the banks, you may want to diversify your bank accounts. You may want to have some credit unions. And of course, you always want to have some cold hard cash at all times. Because we've seen many times before that these online markets can go down. And those that don't have cold hard cash can't buy anything. But if you do have cold hard cash, you can. You also want to prepare by having supplies like extra food, extra fuel, a backup power source. Because again, these could all go down at any time and maybe some grocery stores or some fuel stores won't accept cash. But if you've got food and fuel and power for yourself, you won't have to worry during the chaos. But what you're all probably really wanting to know is how will this affect the markets? Well, this could cause literally the biggest and fastest crash like we've never seen before. Remember the Black Monday in 1987? That was caused by computer algorithm problems, and that caused the fastest stock market crash in history, with the stock market falling about 20% in just one day. Imagine if there was a cyber attack on the stock market, and then all of a sudden, the circuit breakers weren't triggered, and it just caused a free fall in the stock market, and it triggers the algorithm to continue to sell and sell. All the people that have margin debt get margin calls. And once the financial system is hacked, what do you think people are gonna do? They're going to lose faith with keeping their stocks with these brokerages. They're going to lose faith with keeping their money in the banks. This is going to cause bank runs. And this is gonna cause people to pull out their money out of cryptocurrencies and also out of stocks. And they're going to go to real hard assets like real estate, gold, collectibles, and art. So again, everyone, I just want to warn you, it is time to prepare for a scenario like this. And I would not be surprised if we see some kind of financial institution suffer one of these cyber attacks in 2022 because they normally always warn us before these things soonly come. But everyone, that was just my thoughts and opinions on this situation. When I saw this article and this news come up and I've continued to see it, I thought this was very important for me to share this with you. But what do you think? Let me know. Now, for all my loyal viewers and subscribers still watching, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. I was having dinner with a friend not long ago in New York City. We met at a place called Oriol, which is in Midtown. My dinner companion that night was a senior advisor to BlackRock. As you may know, BlackRock is now the largest asset manager on the planet. It directly manages $5 trillion in assets, and it oversees another $11 trillion through its Aladdin platform. That means one firm controls more money than the GDPs of China, Russia, and Japan combined. Anyway, my dinner companion happens to work directly for BlackRock's CEO. As we nursed our white wine and the evening wore on, she let something slip. If I remember her words, she said something like, they want to tell us we can't sell. What was she talking about? Who was she talking about? I placed a few calls, first to my contacts in Washington, then to a few people on Wall Street. Soon I was on a plane for a series of meetings to London, to Geneva, back to New York, then down to South America. As I began connecting the dots, a pattern emerged. It revealed a network of more than 189 individuals positioned inside the world's major financial institutions. Some of them hold senior positions inside the IMF, World Bank, and every central bank in the G20, including our own Federal Reserve. These elites share one vision and they're about to make it a reality. That vision is one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. They've worked for years behind the scenes preparing to realize that vision. They've literally rigged the laws of international finance. Everything is basically in place right now, and there's essentially no way to stop this from happening. When the crisis hits, they'll flip the switch, freezing the global financial system. That will give them time to reset the world economy according to their vision. As the coming crisis unfolds, President Trump will be powerless to stop it. In fact, trying to stop them would probably weaken the president's power altogether. Oh, that, is, that, that, that is amazing, Jim, really. So what did these elites want from your contact at BlackRock? Basically, they want to classify BlackRock as too big to fail. The technical term is Systemically Important Financial Institution, or SIFI. That designation normally applies to banks, such as Bank of America. 
If your bank gets the SIFI label, it means the government will bail you out first in a crisis. But it also means you must turn over control of your bank until the crisis subsides. In this case, they're trying to reclassify BlackRock, an asset manager, as too big to fail. If they succeed, they'll be able to freeze BlackRock when the crisis hits. BlackRock clients won't be able to sell. They won't be able to buy either. Their accounts will go dark indefinitely. And the elite operatives will take control of BlackRock's assets remotely via the internet. But our research shows that their ICE-9 plan goes much, much deeper than that. Now, you refer to their plan as ICE-9. You just said that. What, what does that mean? It's a reference to the Kurt Vonnegut novel, Cat's Cradle. In the book, a mad scientist creates a new form of water molecule called ICE-9. When it comes in contact with other water molecules, it freezes them at room temperature. One drop of ICE-9 can freeze the whole ocean. And that's what these elite operatives are about to do to the world economy. Now, can you share with our viewers exactly who these operatives are and, and what their ultimate goal might be? Like I said, John, more than 189 elite agents have slowly wormed their way into leadership positions across the board. They now sit at or near the head of the IMF, the World Bank, and even our own Federal Reserve. They also control much of what happens at the central banks of China, Russia, India, Brazil, Canada, and Europe. As you know, these institutions form a kind of global superstructure. It forms a kind of snare net encircling all nations. Their leaders aren't democratically elected. They're not accountable to you and me. They're beyond the reach of government and citizens, and yet they hold the fate of the global financial system in their hands. To get a sense of how they operate, imagine an array of floating spheres. One sphere is labeled IMF, one is labeled Fed, one is labeled Bilderberg, one is labeled Wall Street, one is labeled Central Banks, one is labeled Intelligence Agencies, one is labeled Media, and so on. The elites inhabit all of these spheres, and together the network forms a kind of 3D Venn diagram. As I see it, regardless of what sphere they inhabit, the elites all share the same vision, one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. All of their actions are geared toward moving that agenda forward. Now, are, are you able to share the identities of these elites with our viewers? We've identified more than 189 individuals who are in many cases hiding in plain sight. Regardless, they all share the same vision, one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. A short list would include Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England, Raghuram G. Rajan, Vice Chairman of the Bank for International Settlements, Haruhiko Kuroda, Governor of the Bank of Japan, William C. Dudley, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Augustine Carstens, Governor of the Bank of Mexico, Janet Yellen, Chairman of the Board of the Federal Reserve System, Mario Draghi, President of the European Central Bank, Zhu Min, former Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Zhou Xiuquan, Governor of the People's Bank of China. Robert E. Rubin, Chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. This A-list of central bankers and other elites is just the tip of the iceberg. Of course, not one of these elites will tell you outright what's going on, but I've seen and heard enough to connect the dots for myself. Not long ago, for example, I met with one of their senior operatives. He's a leading economist who served as the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the last crisis. He's considered one of the most influential minds in banking today. We met privately during a conclave in Seoul, South Korea. Of course, I'm talking about Ben Bernanke. I came away from my meeting with him stunned and convinced that ICE-9 was real. Not long before that, I set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with another member of the network. His name is Zhu Min, the former deputy governor of China's Central Bank. Until recently, he served as Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Zhu is a brilliant guy, like Bernanke, and he's pleasant and well-meaning. There's no doubt in my mind that he's also a member of the elite network preparing to impose ICE-9 on millions of Americans. But I wasn't done with my research. I have since met with dozens of senior officials, intelligence analysts, and former Wall Street colleagues. My quest led to a final meeting, a face-to-face -face summit with the head of Bilderberg. We met at Rockefeller Center in Manhattan. And he was very eager to get my take on the euro as a currency. I was happy to provide it, of course, in exchange for some valuable intelligence. As I say in my new book, he did not have horns. In fact, he gave me a nice gift when we parted ways, a blue Swedish vase. I keep it in my writing studio at my home in Connecticut. But my point is I came away from all three meetings convinced of one thing. When the next crisis hits, the elites are planning to freeze the financial system and they'll replace it with a new system, one not based on the US dollar. When that happens, we'll wake up to a very strange and disturbing new reality. And, and for our viewers that are watching today, what might their reality look like that morning? How does this manifest? First, they'll have gone to bed knowing that a massive financial crisis was underway. 
But when they wake up, they'll find it has worsened and the contagion has spread worldwide. When they go to withdraw money, their ATM will say close temporarily. When they go to sell stocks, their account will say transaction not available. When they go to their local business, that business will only accept cash if it's open. As citizens realize they're being barred from their money, riots will erupt. It's going to get really bad really but, quickly. But how would such a freeze actually work? And, and wouldn't that be highly illegal? Well, it wouldn't be illegal technically because they've been quietly laying the groundwork for years. They rigged the financial laws, changed the rules of the game to allow this to happen. The stage is set. They have the levers in place. The lights are positioned. Now someone just needs to flick a switch and they'll impose ICE-9 rapidly. And again, all of this will be legal because they rigged the system in their favor. Here in the U.S., for example, Congress pushed through something called the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or IEPA. This allows the government to freeze accounts, assets, even whole institutions at will. The only condition is that there's some threat to national security with a foreign connection. Of course, with a global market, every financial crisis has a foreign connection. Any systemic crisis fits the bill. And the thing is, when the next crisis hits, it's going to be so bad, President Trump won't have any choice but to go along with the elite's plan. Wow, that, that is, you have to admit, that sounds somewhat hard to believe. Now, how could these operatives actually freeze a whole country's financial system? Well, fortunately, we have some recent real-life examples to study. The elites have been conducting a series of dry runs for years, leading up to ICE-9. Look at Cyprus, for example. A few years ago, the Cypriot economy was in trouble, especially the banks. The IMF stepped in and loaned Cyprus $10 billion, but the loan came with strings. Now pay attention, because this is precisely what they're going to do. But imagine it on a global scale. So in exchange for the capital injection, the IMF demanded control over the Cypriot banking system. More specifically, the IMF froze the entire system, literally every bank in the country. And they did that to ensure the IMF's demands were met, including strict capital controls. So how did all of this impact regular citizens? Their local ATMs went dark. Even the bank branch was closed, permanently in some cases. Citizens could not withdraw cash. They couldn't even transfer funds from one account to the other. What came next? Wealth extraction on a grand scale. The IMF basically stole 6 to 10% of all the cash in the Cypriot bank accounts. How did the least justify this? They called it a levy, the price regular citizens had to pay for their government's missteps. Keep in mind, these asset confiscations were done at the balance sheet level with the institutions themselves. They never had to confiscate individual accounts. They froze every account by controlling a handful of the country's biggest banks. When the next crisis hits, we're going to see this here in the U.S. and around the world. And it will be a highly coordinated global attack on the entire system simultaneously. This is Dabu7 sharing with you some critical information in what I consider to be one of the most important videos I've ever put out. I've been trying to give people the warning here for the better part of a decade, trying to get them ready for a lights out situation. And it seems that here on this world stage, the stage is set for such an event to commence. With the finger already pointed at Russia in the other side, and cyber attacks already in motion, it's either going to be an onslaught of cyber attacks that hit in the beginning, or just a flat out EMP strike. An EMP strike is considered to be a first strike move militarily. And we have ran the simulation over and over again. We've gone through all the options of what China, or Russia, or anyone would have in terms of trying to shut down the United States. And time and time again, there's one thing that trumps them all. It is an EMP or a hemp attack over the United States and Canada that cripples them completely. You mix this in with a series of cyber attacks. You bring them to their knees just as they plan to do. There's books written on this by Manly P. Hall, The Secret Destiny of America, and what they plan to do with this country. And they're doing it right now. They have entered the dragon here on this world stage. Rothschild money has controlled both sides of every major world war, World War I, World War II, and this third one will be no different. You need to wake up from all of the left-right paradigm, Hegelian dialect. We spent a decade trying to wake you up to what's happening. So now, the same hand that pulls off all this madness is about to shut down the United States. Not a question of if, but when. It's in their plans. So you can stick your head back in the sand or deny it, that's foolish. Or you can prepare for what's coming. 
Now, it seems the stage is set for this event to actually happen, as we have Russia backing away from the global internet by March 11th, meaning they're going into their own field and their own bubble, similar to China. Both will be ready for this event. The World Economic Forum removed Cyber Polygon from their website. This is big. They are distancing themselves from this on their own forum and has stuck it on its own page, but removed it nonetheless from their site. Huge red flag. And the Russian spy ship that we've been tracking that goes to undersea cables, internet cables, is now missing off of radar, and they just did drills over that region. Also, Russia is top of the line in terms of hemp and super EMP first strike weapons. They have been. It's known. They also have these hypersonic vehicles that we've been talking about the past couple years. But they admit right here that Russia remains the world's leader in non-nuclear EMP weapons, meaning they have mastered detonating a hemp or an EMP device, a nuclear device, at 30,000 kilometers up to 100 kilometers to discharge a burst that will wipe out all the electronics below and give off no nuclear radiation. This is key. They also go on to state that they could pull this off by a couple different ways, missile and all this other stuff over the North Pole, but that is not likely how it's going to be done. They admit that one of the best ways to pull this off is going to be from satellite. They said that they could even put a satellite up in the air, up into into motion, and keep it there circulating for years, and then use it. Well, what do you know? We have that exact situation happening right now. North Korea's KMS-4 Shining Star Satellite that I've spoken about so many times is passing over me right this very second as I shoot this video. It is right above my head. What are the odds of that? Talk about a sign. If this thing was to go right now, all of the East Coast, Canada, everything would be gone. In my opinion, they'll station it right here where my mouse is at to get the best blast. There's a day picked for this. There's a time picked for this, just like they had for Blind 11. You need to know this. In this Shining Star Satellite, was called out by our EMP Commission years ago because they launched this in 2016. The EMP Commission said that if there was anything they ever saw that matched what could be an EMP, it was this. They warned about it, and our government shut them down. So you can keep sleeping on this world stage. The little boogeyman, Kim Jong-un, that keeps popping off missiles, Rocket Man over there, they did that for a reason. They're dropping subliminals, and they're also baiting the history books. In the end, I feel this is going to be a hit backed by Russia and China through this North Korean satellite. And who knows, the United States may drop a tactical nuke just for show on the Korean Peninsula as a strike back. But that's it. You still will not be able to do nothing. The United States will not be able to recover. The lights will go out in the city. That was weird when I said that it flashed off on the screen. I'm leaving you with this. This is my warning to all of you. If you were to ever ask me what major event will bring down the United States of America, where you'll never hear my voice again, never see another YouTube video again, life as you know it will be shattered. It is this right here. When you play a military operation out on another country, to not have to send a single soldier in, not a single shot fired, and cripple the entire nation. This is the way. And they know it. I hope you're ready. I hope you're prepared. They drop subliminals everywhere, even putting Alex Jones in that movie, Amerigeddon. They did everything they could to give you that, that knowledge. It's all over the place. As you can see here, this thing continues to make moves. I hope you don't sleep on it anymore and you realize that the stage is set for not only massive cyber war to commence at any moment because they already have fingers pointing at Russia. They already have a bad guy propped up. You do not think there's not going to be any counter cyber attacks on the United States? Any blowback from all this? Are you kidding me?
It's coming. Hell in a handbasket. At any time. I've tried to get you ready. All my time of existence here. Out here doing this. I fought this fight this whole way. Preparing everybody for this moment. Because when this day happens, our lives change and they will never go back and there will be no changing it. No hitting rewind. No getting supplies once this happens. Be the nightmare nightmares and they will watch it unfold like the Hunger Games from satellite and from drone. Like the sick pieces of work that they are. Get ready. Join me for the live streams, however many we got left. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. And if this doesn't happen, all the way up for years to come, two years pass, and you're in the comments section bumping your gums, maybe you should be counting your blessings instead of running your mouth that the Most High gave us that much more time to get prepared. And if you got busy now, maybe you would have had time to have done something. Those that just been sitting there since 2020, just twiddling their thumbs, you're smoked. Everything's going through the roof. Stuff's disappearing off the shelves. And this is by design. You better know your enemy. Because I know mine. I hate to tell you. It's one and the same out here on this world stage. Live streams where it's at from here. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Gloves come off censorship free. And if I don't ever see you in the flesh here. I'll see you on the other side. I salute all the riders, all the warriors that checked in here to fight this fight righteously in the end, to wake people up, to get them ready for this moment. I love all y'all. God bless you. And may you be victorious in bringing down the beast. Illuminati. <laughs>